Hi, good. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dong Ye Yang from uh, Hitachi Cambridge Lab. And thanks for the invitation that I can be here today to share with you, uh, for example, some what kind of challenges we are facing on the way to building a quantum computer and how we deal with these problems. Well, Hitachi Cambridge Lab is based in Cambridge here and actually is embedded in the Department of Physics of University of Cambridge. And currently we have 70 members, including 14 researchers. At this moment, we are focusing on uh, three uh, research fields inside our lab, including uh, quantum information processing, spin tronics, and uh, uh, quantum photonics. And I belong to the group of quantum information processing. So, uh, can I ask anyone here who has an Android phone, please raise your hand. Okay, quite a number. Thank you. And anyone who has an iPhone, please raise your hand. Okay, cool, thank you. So as you can see, nowadays almost everyone has at least one cell phone. And this is a benchmark of smartphone uh, sales in the third quarter last year. The market is so big, it's more than 500 billion US dollars. However, it's selling this hardware the most profitable thing for these companies. If it is, then why is Apple tracking your locations? And why is Google listening to you? And why is Amazon recalling your history of selling or buying things on the internet? And why is government monitoring you? So apparently, selling this hardware is not the most important thing for them. Then what, what, what it is? So I think that's the user's data. We can even think this user's data is more, even more valuable than gold. We can also say maybe it's new oil in the world nowadays. So how can we refine something valuable out of this big data set? We might need a more efficient algorithm or a more powerful hardware. So one of the solution is to use a quantum computer. Then how can we build a quantum computer? So this is a structure of a quantum computer. It includes the hardware side and the software side. And in our lab, we are focusing on the uh, qubit operation and the storage part. So how do we do that? We believe one of the shortcuts is to use the existing technology and which is also well developed. So we believe that is silicon transistor technology. So this is just a very short story uh, history of uh, silicon field effect transistor. So in 1974, the first uh, field effect transistor was invented. But until 2000, the first thing fed, which is a modified version of a uh, field effect transistor, was announced. Until 2003, human has touched down the submicron semiconductor manufacturing for commercial use. And 2007, in order to uh, overcome the gate leakage issue, people started to use the high-K middle gate material. And until 2011, people started to use the FinFed for uh, commercial products. So I believe nowadays almost all the electronic devices you buy in the market, they are using FinFed. For example, this iPhone sold from last year. The CPU inside contains around 10 billion FinFed inside. So the question is, can we also use FinFed for quantum computing? And that's what we're trying to do. So this is a typical structure of the silicon thin fed we use in our project. In this device, we have a source and drain electrode. And on top of the silicon channel, we have the top gate electrode. <coughs> and this is uh, the uh, cross-section view of the device. So these devices, they behave like a, a very typical field effect transistor at room temperature. As you can see, this is the source strength current as a function of the source strength bias. And this is 
uh, source strength current as a function of the gate. However, we found when we cool down the devices to low temperature, below 4.2K, then they start to have a quantum phenomenon. So for example, in this device, you can see the periodic Coulomb oscillations. So we can further modify the structure of the simple fin fed. In, we split the top gate into two split gates. And we can use those two split gates to induce two quantum dots at the corner of the silicon channel. Then we can um, control those, the, the charge states of those two quantum dots by using the, the two split gates very well. So potentially, we can use those two quantum dots as one qubit. So if we further modify the device, we make multiple uh, split gates on top of the silicon channel, then we can create multiple uh, quantum dots. So potentially, we can have multiple qubits in one fin fed. And we have demonstrated that first we use the, a simple fin fed structure with only one top gate to create two corner dots in the silicon channel and use these two quantum dots as one uh, two level system. So we use them as one charge qubit. And we have the coherence time around uh, 300 picoseconds. And if we use this type of split gate fin fed, we can observe spin bouquet behavior between these two corner quantum dots. And if we use the multiple split gate fin fed, we can reconstruct the uh, quantum dot uh, configurations. So we, we think if we are able to combine all these findings, we can use this uh, fin fed for uh, quantum computing purpose. So the next challenge is, although we are able to create the small quantum, the qubit system in one device, are we, ab are we able to scale up the qubit system? Well, from the engineering point of view, it's not super difficult because the semiconductor manufacturing technology is already very well developed. So far, we are able to fabricate thousands and thousands of thin fats on one wafer. For example, this is a 300 millimeter SI wafer. But the next issue will be that if we have so many devices, how can we deal with them? If we want to characterize one device, it takes several days. So if we want to characterize all these devices, it will take more than two years. So this is not realistic. So we have to um, develop a, a much faster characterization method. So we use this uh, reflectometry technique. So the idea of reflectometry is that we attach a resonator here to the gate of the fin fed. And when we apply the gate voltage to the, this device, the, which is a fin fed, the device will be switched on and off. And when we monitor, uh, the resonance frequency of this resonator, we can see the uh, on-off state of this device. And the advantages of using the reflectometry technique is are that first, this can provide higher resolution, and second, this is really fast. So th here I have a comparison between the uh, reflectometry measurement and the conventional DC measurement. So in DC measurement, we just measure the source strength current as a function of the one top gate voltage in the x-axis and the back gate voltage. Uh, the back gate voltage can be applied from the, the silicon substrate. So in this stability diagram, we can observe those Coulomb oscillations. If we repeat the same uh, stability diagram but using reflectometry, we can observe more details of these Coulomb oscillations. And one more thing is that the, the measurement on the left-hand side using reflectometry, actually the resolution is 20 times higher than the right one. However, the measurement time is less than 50% of the DC measurement. So it's really fast. 
Okay, although we can use reflectometry to do the characterization, but we still have so many devices. If we want to measure them, it still takes time. So can we even make it faster? So we go back to the starting point. If we have one simple fin fat with only one top gate, this is the typical structure. And if we want to use one fin fat as one cubic, the basic requirement is that we need to induce two quantum dots and only two quantum dots in the channel. However, in reality, in some cases, we only have one quantum dot in the channel. In some cases, we have multiple quantum dots in the channel. And the type of these quantum dot systems can be identified by measuring the typical Coulomb diamond diagrams. And we can only know what kind of quantum dot system we have in the devices until we call the, uh, the devices to low temperature and measure them. It takes time. So how can we accelerate the selection um, uh, process? Meaning, how can we know whether the device is useful or not useful for our purpose? Useful meaning only two quantum dots in the channel. So the first thing we're thinking of is, can we use a robot to accelerate the process, the selection process? Specifically, can we use machine learning to do this? So the idea of using machine learning is that if we are able to predict the low temperature behavior of those devices from what we have from room temperature measurement, this can be much faster. Because the room temperature measurement is quite fast. It takes less than one minute. But if we want to cool down the device and identify the device, at least takes two to three days. So if we want to use machine learning to do the, uh, say, prediction, we need to go through several steps. First, we need to build a database. And then we have to train the machine. And in the end, we can use the machine to do the prediction for us. So the first step to build a database. So we measure those devices at room temperature. And we do very simple measurement. We just measure the source strength current as a function of the gate voltage. And from this simple measurement, we can already extract several electrical parameters. For example, the threshold voltage and the subthreshold swing and the mobilities of these devices. The next step, we can feed the machine with all these uh, parameters we, we have at room temperature. And we still have to tell the machine what kind of device we have. For example, the device has a single quantum dot or a multiple quantum dot or double quantum dot inside the device. So we have to do some sort of labeling. Therefore, we cool down the device to 4.2K and then measure the source strength current as a function of the two gate. One is the top gate, and the second gate is the uh, back gate. So this is the result. In x-axis, this is top gate voltage, and here is uh, back gate voltage. So from this particular uh, result here, actually, it's still to distinguish whether this device has a single quantum dot or double quantum dot, because we do not observe the typical um, honeycomb structure of a double quantum dot system. So we have to develop uh, uh, an analysis method. So the method is the following. So for example, first I only do one line scan along this green uh, dot line. And we have, then we have this uh, profile of the uh, Coulomb oscillations. Then we define the delta Vg as the interval between the Coulomb peaks. As, so we have delta Vg1, delta Vg2, and so on and so on. And we do the same profiling through the whole stability diagram. So we have this result. And then we can get the delta Vgs as a function of the back gate along this direction. And one interesting thing is, at some point, we find those delta Vgs start to segregate into two groups. And we try to understand why. So we did a simple simulation. We just 
build a very simple uh, double quantum dot circuit and simulate the source strength current through the double quantum dot as a function of the two side gate. Then in this simulation, we see the honeycomb structure, which is a, a typical uh, feature of a double quantum dot system. So if we do a line scan along this blue line, as we do here along this green line, and then we can see those quantum, uh, the Coulomb uh, oscillations. And we also found that those Coulomb oscillations are not perfectly uh, periodic but they show some sort of uh, pattern. The pattern is, we see the odd number of delta VGs are always smaller than the next even number of delta VGs. Meaning, you see here, delta VG1 is smaller than delta VG2 here, and delta VG3 is smaller than delta VG4. And we also see this pattern in our experiment. So when we see the segregation into two groups region, delta VG1s are always smaller than delta VG2s. And delta VG3s are always smaller than delta VG4s. So this can give us a hint that in this region, we might have a double quantum dot system. And above this boundary, because we don't see this segregation, so we might have only one quantum dot. In order to convince ourselves, we do the uh, Coulomb diamond measurement. So in this region, we select one point, and we see the uh, behavior of a double quantum dot uh, system. Why? We see those quantum, uh, these uh, Coulomb diamonds. We have one small diamond, big diamond, and small diamond, big diamond, and small diamond, and big diamond. And the small diamonds belong to one quantum dot and the big diamonds belongs to, belong to the second quantum dot. So we know there are two quantum dots. And in this region, above the boundary, we see those monotonic uh, con uh, oscillations, the uh, Coulomb uh, diamonds. So th in this region, indeed, this is just a single quantum dot system. So by using this analysis method, we routinely measure uh, many, many devices. We measure the devices at room temperature and then cool down and to low temperature and identify what kind of quantum dot system we have. And then we can uh, train the machine. So here, this is just a small size of database. We have uh, 21 devices. And in this table, we have the physical uh, parameters like uh, width of the channel and length of the gate and also the electrical parameters, uh, threshold voltage, sub threshold swing, and mobilities. So we can feed the machine with these parameters. And if we do that, it looks like, visualize that, it looks like this. So in this case, I feed the machine with three parameters. So it looks like a three-dimensional space. With, so we have width and length of the channel and sub threshold swing here. And we label those data points with different uh, quantum dot type. So it looks like three dimensional here. So if we input a new device, for example, this black uh, cross, then the machine can help us to predict whether this device belongs to uh, either single or double or multiple quantum dot. So uh, to do the prediction, I just randomly uh, selected 17 devices out of these 21 devices as the training set and used the rest five devices as the test set to see whether the prediction can be precise or not. And this is the result. So initially, we only input two parameters, which are the physical parameters, the width and length of the device. However, we see the prediction accuracy is only 40%, which is not good. It's only a little bit higher than the random guess, the 33% here. So we understood that we have to input more uh, parameters. So we input extra one parameters, like the threshold voltage and then the sub-threshold swing, and uh, until we input all the parameters we have. Then we found when we use 
the parameters of width and length of the channel and the subfacial swing, we can have the prediction uh, accuracy as high as 70%, um, which is not bad, but not great. Anyway, but this 70% is already uh, more than twice of the random guess. And we think uh, we are able to improve the accuracy if we can have a larger uh, training data set. Um, also, we think this is just the beginning. In the future, we will and definitely will have more issues. For example, we need have to learn how to do the manipulation for this uh, large-scale qubit system. And we also have to improve the fertility of the qubits. And also, we have to somehow input uh, an error correction uh, protocol to the large-scale qubit system. And one more important thing, more important, is that we need large-scale collaborations. We cannot do this alone. It's not possible. That's why Hitachi is collaborating with other, many other groups through, for example, EU uh, projects. We previously have a EU project called TOLOP, but it has been ended two years ago. And currently, we have a project called uh, Mosquito, which is also an EU project. And we, this project has been approved before Brexit, so we're secure. And the idea of this EU project is to use uh, silicon CMOS for quantum computing. So in the end, uh, thanks for your attention. And I would like to also thank all my colleagues at uh, Kintachi Cambridge Lab. And also thank to uh, some people like David. David is a PhD student from uh, University of Bristol. He has been working with us for around two years through the CDT scheme. And Theodore and John are students from uh, University of Cambridge. And also thank to all the members in the EU project. Thank you. Thank you, Sungyi. Uh, are there any questions? Just here. Uh, hey, thank you very much for the talk. So. My understanding was that things like the variation in the threshold voltage of this thing are like intrinsic to the, you know, the um, fabrication process. So do, is there a problem with, is that kind of variation a problem for having multiple qubits or do you, does it, so long as you know what the variations are, does it just not matter? Um, I think it's the, some defects during the fabrication. Yeah, but because the dimensions, those features are so small, it's like uh, 30 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to control. But, but does it cause a problem for, I mean, is there a way of getting around the variation? Does, it, does the variation matter for? Well, it, if, if we have, yes, it matters. Because if we want to perfectly use those devices, it should, we should have one quantum dot mm -hmm. on each side. If we have many, for example, like this one, we have, if we, for example, have two quantum dots here, then we don't know which one we're using it. Mm. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's better, in the most simplest way, is that we control one quantum dot at one time, not several. Right, OK, yeah. yeah. Right. OK, in the interest of keeping the time, um, we'll pause there. You can always ask questions in the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.